Hello, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm honored to be here participating in the Emirates Neurology Virtual Conference of 2021 and to talk about unmet medical needs in the management of migraine, what the patient needs. I'm Don Buse, a clinical professor of neurology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine and a member of the board of directors of the American Headache Society. And here are my disclosures. Let's start by talking about migraine criteria, prevalence, impact, and unmet need. Now, I know that you've already heard some of these data in this meeting, so I'll go quickly. As a quick reminder, migraine is highly prevalent globally and is associated with high disease burden. In fact, the Global Burden of Disease study estimated that more than a billion people live with migraine currently around the world. It's the third most prevalent illness. It's the most prevalent neurologic disorder in people aged younger than 50 years. And as we know, it certainly has a strong genetic heritability in that about 90% of people with migraine have some family history of migraine in their parents, their grandparents, their siblings. As we know, migraine is commonly divided by its frequency into episodic or chronic migraine, which is generally fewer than 15 headache days per month or more than 15 headache days per month. When you look at the ICHD criteria of eight or which for chronic migraine are linked to migraine. In addition, it can also be divided in other ways such as with or without aura um, and some other specialty types of migraine. As we know, migraine carries a great burden of disease. It is the most common complaint encountered by a neurologist in day-to-day -day practice associated with high levels of cost and disability. People with episodic migraine in one year may be likely to develop chronic migraine the following year. In fact, 2.5% of those who have episodic in any given year will have chronic migraine the following year. And migraine is widely underdiagnosed and undertreated globally. In fact, in US studies, such as the American Migraine Prevalence and Prevention Study or the CAMEO study, only about 50% of people who meet criteria for migraine have talked to a healthcare professional about their migraine. Migraine, according to the Global Burden of Disease Study, is the second leading cause of years lived with disability worldwide across all ages and sexes, and the number one cause of people from their teens, 15, to midlife, to 49. And migraine can virtually impact all important aspects of life big and small, work, school, family, social, financial, psychological, and emotional functioning. In the Middle East and North Africa, according to the same study, migraine is the third leading year cause for years lived with disabilities for both sexes. It is responsible for 6% of all years lived with disability in the region. For more detailed and very well done epidemiologic studies showing country specific prevalences in this region, I encourage you to look at the Lifting the Burden Global Campaign Against Headache website. They have published studies with data on prevalence for many of the countries in this region. And you can see the website here at the bottom of, of, the, uh, of this slide. And in addition, they also have really well written fact sheets on many aspects of living with migraine, managing migraine, and other severe disease, headache disorders um, written in multiple languages. So that's a great resource for your patients. As I mentioned, we know that migraine is commonly divided into episodic and chronic migraine by monthly headache day frequency. And chronic migraine with the higher monthly headache days is associated with a range of negative aspects compared to episodic migraine. Uh, those with chronic migraine have worse socioeconomic status, greater headache-related disability, greater impact, worse health-related quality of life, higher comorbidities, increased healthcare resource utilization, both for migraine and for all cause, higher direct and indirect cost, and increased family burden, all of which is known from scientific published data and probably another range of negative factors that you know from your patients as well. But when we look at a more fine scale, we see that actually the burden of migraine increases with every day per month of increases in headache. And this is data from the International Burden of Migraine Study, a, a, a study done with uh, 10 different 
international countries, including European and US countries and Asian countries. And not surprisingly here using the Midas with each increase in monthly headache day, our respondents reported greater burden and disability in their life. And so more recently in an analysis of the American Migraine Prevalence and Prevention Study, which is a US study, uh, my colleagues and I, including Dr. Richard Lipton, who's the PI and our colleagues looked at a range of factors dividing episodic migraine into several groups. The lowest frequency episodic migraine having zero to three headache days per month, the moderate frequency between four to seven, the high frequency episodic migraine from eight to 14, and the chronic migraine with 15 or more headache days per month. We looked at a range of outcomes. And here on this slide, you can see displayed the rates of various comorbidities. And we see how these rates of comorbidities increase with each step in monthly headache day frequency, including on the far left, chronic pain, arthritis, circulation problems, ulcers, depression, which we can see the rates increase quite dramatically with each step up in headache day frequency, and asthma. And we found this to be the case in more comorbidities than are able to show on this slide, including cardiac comorbidities, anxiety, sleep comorbidities, restless leg, um, and, and so many other comorbidities as well. We also know that there is great family burden due to migraine. So in the CAMEO study, which was a US study, we assessed not only probands with migraine, but with their permission, we also sent surveys to a spouse or partner and also sent surveys to a child who was an adolescent. So at least 13 years of age or older who lived in the household. And we asked about a range of impacts on family life, personal life, including marriage, including parenting relationships with children. And here we can see responses to these particular questions about both family relationships and family planning. And we can see that the percent of respondents who agreed, if I not, did not have headaches, I'd be a better spouse, increased dramatically with each group. If I did not have headaches, I'd be a better parent increased dramatically. And we even see in the bottom line when we asked people, did you choose not to have children because of migraine, have fewer children or delay having children? We see that that increases as well. And that 10% of our respondents with chronic migraine said that they chose not to have children, had fewer children or delayed having children because of their chronic migraine. And we have seen this same report now in the ARMOR study, the American Migraine Registry study, as well as the Eurolight European study, where people have said, because of my migraine, I did not have children or I had fewer children or delayed having children. I mentioned the Eurolight study, which was a European study of multiple countries that looked at many aspects of living with migraine. And one aspect they did ask about was, what is the impact on relationships and family planning? They found very similar results as we found in the US Cameo study that a, some people said that in fact, about 1% of respondents said that they did not have children, they delayed having children um, due to their migraine. About half of a percent reported that their migraine had caused marital separation or divorce. And on the left, we can see that um, nearly 20% overall, 19.7% um, of women and 12.8% of men reported that their migraine caused difficulties in their relationships. The Eurolight study also asked about stigma. We could see on the right side, the yellow female respondents, on the left side, the male respondents in blue, that um, both people with migraine and they also asked about tension type headache, avoided telling people about their migraine or about their headache disease, be it migraine or tension type headache. Um, and we could see about a third of people, both men and women with migraine avoided people telling people about it. And about a quarter of people with tension type headache didn't talk about it due to stigma. Um, about 10% said that their family and friends don't understand what they go through, what their burden is like, what the experience is like. And another about 10% just over said their employers and colleagues don't understand as well. And that migraine causes difficulties, not only in family and friends, but in the workplace. So let's move on to migraine management. Knowing that migraine is impactful and disabling, 
what can we as healthcare professionals do to help improve the lives of those living with this disease? Well, we like to think of a broad range of treatments available to us. These are all data supported, scientifically supported, and in most cases, guideline approved or FDA approved, starting with education and lifestyle, which benefits everyone with migraine. In some cases, behavioral therapies, pharmacologic therapies, neuromodulation, and complementary and integrative therapies. And the optimal treatment plan is often a combination of some of these approaches combined and tailored to the needs of your individual patient. The lifestyle modifications that data show us really do make a difference in migraine management include sleep regulation and good sleep hygiene, trying to maintain a regular sleep-wake cycle every day of the week and getting enough quality sleep, exercise on a regular basis, staying hydrated and eating healthy, basically staying, a, uh, staying hydrated and keeping steady levels of, of blood sugar. There's not any particular diet which has actually been proven to be more effective than any other, just healthy eating and staying hydrated. Stress management, social support and education. These are all very important factors for our patients to live well with migraine. It helps regulate the nervous system, regulate the hypothalamic pituitary axis, which can be so over-responsive and reactive for people who live with migraine. And keeping nice regular routines and cycles in all of these factors can be very helpful for that nervous system. As we all know, we tend to divide our treatment for migraine attacks into acute and preventive approaches, as well as interventional approaches, which may be acute or preventive. And a couple of these actually fall into both the categories. So you will have just heard from Professor Richard Lipton, an excellent talk on an overview of acute therapies for migraine. As a reminder, they may be migraine specific or not specific. They may be available over the counter or by prescription only. And generally, they will include NSAIDs, triptans, the new diatans, ergotamines, the G pants, and some neurostimulation. And since you just heard from Professor Lipton in a terrific overview and summary of acute treatments, I will focus a bit more on preventive therapies. Those may include the lifestyle modification, biobehavioral therapies, neurostimulation, the calcitonin gene related peptide targeted MABs monoclonal antibodies, and I'll refer to those as MABs for shorthand, and some of the older traditional oral preventives, including some from the beta blocker family, calcium channel blocker family, antidepressant family, anticonvulsant family, and onobotulinum toxin A, which is specifically in the US FDA approved for chronic migraine. And then some of the interventional approaches include trigger points, nerve blocks, and other interventional therapies. So when do we want to consider migraine prevention? There are US, Canadian, and European guidelines, as well as a American Headache Society position statement first published about a year ago in 2019 with an update coming soon. And those guidelines all say about the same thing. You look for two things. You look for disability and you look for monthly headache day frequency. And so we wanna think about disability when migraine is significantly interfering with the patient's functioning, maybe at work, school, or at home, when it's causing significant impairment. And then we think about a threshold uh, around four or more days per month with both migraine pain and symptoms, as well as that disability is a time when we like to consider preventive therapies. Again, prevention is a wide range of pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic options, which are often tailored and combined for our individual patient to get the most optimized outcomes. We also think about prevention when acute medications are ineffective, contraindicated, associated with troublesome adverse events, or overuse, such as in medication overuse. Medication overuse is almost always a very good sign that we need to think about prevention. And then of course, patient preference as well is something we wanna take into consideration. I mentioned that there are behavioral approaches with evidence for cognitive behavioral therapy. Those that are guideline approved include cognitive behavioral therapy, relaxation training, and biofeedback. 
And those with emerging evidence include the mindfulness-based therapies, as well as acceptance and commitment therapy. There are various forms of data-supported neuromodulation targeting different nerves for migraine prevention, as well as some for acute treatment, uh, and some that are approved for both therapies. And these are a nice option, either as a standalone option or combined with either pharmacologic, behavioral, or lifestyle modification. And often patients may have a preference on how they feel about how well these approaches work for them and what their choices are. As a quick overview of the pharmacologic therapies for migraine prevention, we have some traditional oral preventive therapies, which have been used for decades with good evidence. And often while they might've been effective, they may have tolerability problems or patients may have side effects, which are challenging from these. They generally fall into the classes of anti-epileptic drugs, beta blockers, angiotensin system, antidepressants, some specific. Um, and then onobotulinum toxinase, I mentioned, is specifically US FDA approved for chronic migraine only. So that's 15 or more headache days per month. That's the only one on, that, on this whole slide that is just for chronic migraine. And, and then there are the CGRP targeted monoclonal antibodies. Those are gonna be fremonazumab, arinumab, galconazumab, and eptinizumab. And I will talk about those in more detail in just a moment. There's also nutraceuticals and some other classes of medications which do have evidence, some evidence for prevention and can be used either independently or combined with other preventive approaches. Those are gonna include some of the herbs and vitamins as well as some other type of approaches that you can see here on this slide. And on this slide, everything that has an asterisk is FDA approved, but everything on this slide are our approaches that are used in combination or singularly by various providers. As a quick step back, and I know that you've had migraine pathophysiology throughout this course uh, that, that we've been, been participating in, but as a quick reminder, migraine is associated with neuroinflammation of central and or peripheral nociceptive structures, and there's multiple brain regions that are implemented in a migraine attack including the overlapping phases and ranges of symptoms. The trigeminal vascular system plays a central role in migraine. And when the trigeminal vascular system is activated and calcitonin gene related peptide or CGRP is released during a migraine attack. It's also known that CGRP can trigger a migraine if given uh, via um, study in a research study to someone who experiences migraine. So CGRP is active uh, in, in many ways during migraine attacks. There are four migraine preventive CGRP targeted monoclonal antibodies to the CGRP or to its receptor. And they are arinumab, fremonizumab, galconizumab, and eptinizumab. And here you can see some of their differences. Their half-lives are all about one month. Their dosing is a bit different, where three of them are monthly and one of them is quarterly. In addition, some of them are injected through a self-injector subcutaneously, while some are given via IV. So as a quick reminder, rinumab is a monthly uh, subcutaneous shot. Fremonizumab is monthly um, or quarterly. Um, and galconizumab is monthly again, and eptimizumab is a quarterly IV infusion. They do have different target receptors. So arinumab is the targets the CGRP receptor, whereas the other three target the CGRP peptide or ligand. And you can see in the US, they have various approvals, mostly all for migraine prevention. But um, in addition, galconazumab does have an approval for cluster headache prevention. Now, importantly on the bottom, you can see the note that to the best of my knowledge, that arinumab and galconizumab are available in the UAE. Eptinizumab is to be launched soon in the UAE, but fremonizumab is not available there. 
and I'm sure that this availability also varies by country and you may be attending from a different country, but that can give us kind of an idea of the landscape of what's available. So let's talk a little bit about their data. Um, there are a whole range of clinical trials uh, and data available that were used, and I pulled together just some highlights. So for irinumab in CM prevention, a 6.7 day reduction in monthly migraine days was found in the pivotal trial, which would uh, translate to 79 fewer migraine days per year. In feminizumab clinical trials, the percentage of patients with a reduction of at least 50% in the average number of headache days per month uh, for both comparisons with placebo was 38% in the quarterly group, 41% in the monthly group compared with 18% in the placebo group. Um, both galcanizumab and eptinizumab migraine responder rates in EM registration studies and phase two CM studies with 75% or more reductions in monthly migraine days were more than 33% of participants. And importantly, all four MABs work in CM prevention, both with or without acute medication overuse, which were pre-specified secondary analyses in clinical trials. Looking into safety and tolerability issues of the four MABs, injection site reactions were the most common ACE AEs with subcutaneous administration, while nasopharyngitis was the most common AE with IV administration. In terms of label warnings, hypersensitivity, primarily injection site reactions, were reported with all four MABs, and constipation with serious complications such as hospitalization or hypertension has been reported with arinumab, so that's in its label. No serious cardiovascular AEs were reported in any of the placebo-controlled clinical trials. However, a recent case report suggesting a possible association between CGRP inhibition and ischemic stroke in a patient receiving arinumab is noted in the literature. And in terms of pregnancy and lactation, animal data indicate potential for fetal harm, so they are not advised in pregnant or lactating women. So I know that this was a, a quick presentation. I want to leave with some excellent resources, whether you're looking for information for yourself as a healthcare professional or for your patients. The International Headache Society is listed here as a wonderful resource. The World Health Organization with the and the Lifting the Burden Campaign Against Headache, which has both country-specific prevalence rates as well as a range of excellent patient materials in various languages. So that might be a great resource to find patient education materials for your patients or to send them right to that website. In conclusion, there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic. We're really at a great point in our ability to both understand migraine pathophysiology and to treat our patients. We know that migraine is common, it's disabling and debilitating, both globally as well as specifically within the Middle East and Africa, and that associated disability impact and cost all increase as monthly headache days increase. The good news is there are a whole range of effective and tolerable acute and preventive therapies, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic, and clinical trials show that effective treatment of monthly migraine or headache days reduces disability and impact reduces rates of comorbidities, reduces direct and indirect costs, and improves quality of life. In addition, lifestyle modification can also help improve all of those outcomes. So there's a lot for our patients to be optimistic about and a lot that we can do as healthcare professionals to help them achieve those optimal outcomes. I really wanna thank you for this kind invitation to participate in your meeting and for your attention today.